In the Crito, Plato rejects the claim that we should give any special credence to majority opinion. The majority would think that Socrates' choice to passively accept his death sentence in prison was unreasonable. However, Socrates doesn't think that the majority is particularly wise on these matters, and in the Crito, he argues for this claim. In lecture, we termed one of these arguments the argument from wisdom. Below is an outline of the first half of that argument. Premise 1. If someone is wise in matters pertaining to the good of the human soul, then they must also be wise in matters pertaining to justice and injustice. In other words, they must also be a moral expert. Premise 2. The majority is not wise in matters pertaining to justice and injustice. In other words, they are not moral experts. Conclusion, the majority is not wise in matters pertaining to the human soul. The purpose of this argument is to demonstrate that the majority lacks a certain type of wisdom, specifically, wisdom of how best to care for the human soul, or wisdom about how a human being should best live his or her life. And importantly, the reason the majority lacks this wisdom is, more fundamentally, that they lack knowledge of justice and injustice. As such, we should not look to the majority for guidance about how best to live our lives precisely because the majority cannot claim any expertise in matters of morality. What this means is that for Socrates... There is a vital and important connection between the moral life, or the life of justice and virtue, and the good life, the life well lived for a human being. The opinion of the majority about how one ought to live and act is irrelevant because, according to the argument from wisdom, the majority lacks any real knowledge of morality. But of course, that purported lack of wisdom only matters if we assume that... There is a connection between the moral life and the good life in the first place. But is that assumption correct? To consider this point further, let's ask the following question. Is it possible for someone who is thoroughly morally bad, corrupt, and wicked to live a good life? We might be tempted to point out that it would be difficult for such a person to live well because, in all likelihood, they would eventually be found out and punished. It is unlikely that someone who consistently acted unjustly would be able to get away with their bad behavior forever. Yet, even if this claim is true, it doesn't really answer the question we are asking. The question being asked is whether it is possible for someone who is morally bad to live a good life. So, let's suppose for the sake of argument that this unjust person will not suffer any punishment or bad consequence as a result of their behavior. Could they live a good human life in that case? If it is true that the morally bad person can live well, then that tells us something important about what constitutes the good life. Namely, that moral virtue is, at most, incidental to living well. Perhaps, practically speaking, acting in a virtuous way will help you gain friends and personal advantages. Yet, on this view, virtue itself does not significantly contribute to our well-being. Instead, the good life must be comprised of something other than moral virtue, Pleasure, wealth, honor, power, or perhaps even just tranquility and peace of mind might be some popular candidates. However, the argument from wisdom shows that Socrates rejects this point of view. If the ability to live well requires knowledge of morality that leads to virtuous action, then the good life must be impossible for the morally corrupt person. No matter how much prestige, power, reputation, physical security, or wealth this person gains through taking advantage of others, they will never be able to attain what matters most a life well lived, the only sort of life that Socrates believed was worth living for a human being. Many, both in Plato's time and in our own, have found this claim puzzling. If the morally bad person is never found out and is never punished and never suffers any ill effects from their misbehavior, 
then doesn't their attainment of power, wealth, and prestige clearly give them an enviable life? At least doesn't it give them a life worth living? Addressing this question was actually one of the foremost preoccupations of Plato's philosophical writing, and he provides an extended answer to it in his most famous work, The Republic. So Plato did not hold this view lightly without understanding the force of the objections against it. He was keenly aware of the way in which we are naturally influenced by our desires for material gain, wealth, and power, and thus he was aware of the temptations of immorality and vice. Ultimately, however, he believes the influence of these desires foists an illusion upon us, a very potent illusion that constantly encourages us to look for human flourishing in all the wrong places. It is true that we have various material and bodily desires, and that the sway these desires have over us can be overwhelming. But that doesn't mean that satisfying these desires is the path to human flourishing. Just because our desires for pleasure, material gain, and power may have a strong influence on us, doesn't mean we should allow these desires to rule our conduct. In fact, upon examination, Plato believes we will recognize that these desires should be subject to something more important, something higher. Consider the nature of our desires. Each desire has some object it is directed toward and narrowly focused upon. This narrow focus prevents us, if we are completely under the sway of that desire, from taking competing considerations into account. Our desire for food is not worried about whether we will overeat. Our desire for sleep doesn't care about being late for work. Our desire for material gain is not really concerned with the moral wrongness of theft. And our desire for status and reputation is not concerned with the harm that unbridled ambition can cause to other people. If we had a merely animal nature, then there would be no question of whether it was appropriate or just to pursue these desires. Animals operate merely upon instinct and, generally speaking, do not give a second thought to whether their desires might cause them to do something imprudent, immoral, or unjust. However, human beings are not like animals in this respect. Humans have base instincts and desires, but we also have the unique ability to discern what is true, good, and just. An ability which, if Socrates is correct, we only exercise properly through living an examined life. Again, the only sort of life that Socrates believes is worthy of a human existence. What all of this shows is that living a good life, or living well, is not something that happens by accident. Neither is it something that happens simply by following the natural course of our desires. It is something that takes intention and effort. Intention and effort directed toward asking difficult moral questions and determining what moral virtue demands of us. This is precisely why Socrates is not keen to accept the advice of the majority. Undoubtedly, a majority of people probably would think that Socrates is being unnecessarily obstinate in his refusal to escape prison. Why not just escape if you can do so without any negative repercussions? Notice, however, that this is a line of thought which prioritizes our immediate inclinations and desires without reflecting on whether following those inclinations and desires is consistent with justice. The very fact that the majority thinks in this way demonstrates their lack of moral wisdom. If that is the case, then to simply accept majority opinion would be to lead a life which isn't in accordance with what it means to be human. A genuinely human life, in Socrates' view, is one in which our desires must be subordinated to rational consideration of what is morally right. Ultimately, this is why it is only possible to live a good life by leading a moral life.